Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. If you have a handout, top right of the handout. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Father, I ask that you would open your word to us. Let us get a glimpse into Paul's life as we enter into a study of the book of Romans. Rabbi Shaul was raised as an observant Jew as a young boy and through his adolescence he became a rabbi he studied he was a Pharisee he studied under some of the greatest teachers in Israel he was considered a temple Jew an Orthodox Jew he was also noted as a great persecutor of the church. He stood by while Stephen was stoned, giving approval, watching over some of the garments of those who were stoning him. Rabbi Shaul was on his way one day to capture believers, Christians, put them in jail, many of them would be executed. But on the trip to do that, Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, appeared to him on the road to Damascus with a great bright shining light. The apostles said, who are you? Jesus identified himself who he was. And the next thing that Rabbi Shaul said would change his life, change what would become the Bible, the New Testament, in a dramatic way. It would change the way pastors, teachers, and leaders and all of us would lead our lives. With Paul's own words describing what happened to him from Acts chapter 22, verse 10. He, this is what he said to the Lord after Jesus identified who he was. He said, what shall I do, Lord? What shall I do? Now, this handout is from five years ago. I did the book of Romans on Fridays five years ago. So I'm gonna use the same handouts. That'll save me a little bit of time on setting up the handouts. However, uh, I'm just gonna read the text and make comments on it. So I'm not gonna follow very closely the text, uh, or rather the handout on the left, though I will make reference to it from time to time. I just wanna read through the scripture and give you a summary of this powerful first seven verses. Notice verse one, Paul, a bond servant. Some of your translations may have slave. It's important to note here is a two-line summary of this passage. Are you ready? We are servants first and called second. Servants first, 
called second. Now there's some specific, specific, I can't even say it, specifics of that that I need to clarify. But Paul identifies as a servant and what was his heart? What shall I do, Lord? That's a picture of a servant. What shall I do, Lord? Verse 1 goes on to say that he was called to be an apostle. One of the problems that we have in the church today with our pastors and leaders, that there is more emphasis on the call than upon servanthood. Shepherds, pastors, shepherds should be servants, first of all. About two years ago, a lady called me on the phone and she said, would you mind coming to my house and praying over the house? I feel an evil presence is in the house. And I said, well, do you attend a church? And she mentioned the church here locally. And I said, well, you have a pastor of that church. She said, yeah, but when I called the church office, they said he doesn't do that kind of stuff. He's a teaching pastor. I said, oh, okay. You better call them again and tell them that you want their servant, Pastor Shepherd, to come to your house. Learning to be a servant is not an easy thing for many of us. We're more consumed about what our wants are. Remember Rabbi Shaul, what he said on the road to, what shall I do? Most of us are saying, Lord, here's what I want to do. Not Lord, what shall I do? It took me many years to understand servanthood. I spent almost 20 years following the model of what I felt I was called to do. There was a whole movement for a while within the church where we had teaching pastors and that's all they did. They never made a house call. They never hung around to talk to people. They never prayed for, they were just teachers. Boy, I want that kind of a job. That's pretty cool. When I came to South Coast Assembly some 33 years ago or so, I was introduced to a pastor of that church who was a model of what it means to be a servant shepherd. A servant shepherd. He was a good teacher, but he modeled servanthood to me like none other. And through that process, I become a better servant I haven't got there yet, I can tell you. The point that I need to make here is that all of us, like Rabbi Shaul, are called to be servants first. When I understand what it means to be a servant, then I can fulfill all the rest that Jesus calls me to do and to be if I am a servant first. Back to verse 1 from your handout, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. So Paul is what's called an apostle. It simply means one who is sent. Have you ever been sent to the grocery store? Come on, be honest with me. Maybe when you were a kid, somebody sent you to the grocery store. If you're married, you've been sent to the grocery store. What's the difference between being sent to the grocery store and being sent by God? There's not a lot of difference. To the grocery store, you usually have a list. You have something in mind. You don't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I think I'm going to go to the grocery store. You wander through there and you don't buy anything. No, you have a purpose to it. 
God has called us all, sent us all into the world with a list. It's to bring people to the kingdom of God. It's to pray for people. All of us are sent, are apostles in that sense. There's a formal apostleship that Paul had and some had, but all of us are sent of God. Now, if you're going to be sent of God, you have to have the next quality. You have to be separated from the things of the world to the things of God. I think today the church is probably at a crossroads of this issue. The church over the last 10 years has sought to be more like the world with the idea of winning the world, but in the process have become worldly themselves. That's my opinion. I'm not really concerned necessarily about worship styles and all of these things. But I got to tell you, the gospel of God is not attractive to those that are perishing. The Bible says that. To those that are lost, you share the gospel, they're not going to get excited. Now those who God had his hand on and you share the gospel, their heart will be turned to him. You don't need great music. You don't need great preaching. You need a servant's heart and a sent attitude and an attitude of being separated from all the gimmicks that the world wants to give you. You can go online and find a hundred courses on how to lead people to Jesus, on how to do evangelism, on how to start a church, on how to do worship, on how to do being a Christian, hundreds of self-help books. There's the best tool for winning others for Christ. Here it is. You ready? You don't need a course. You need a testimony. You need to tell people what Jesus has done for you. That's the best discipleship evangelism tool that I've ever heard of. Once I was lost, hear how I was found, and here is what Jesus is doing in my life now. That's the best evangelistic tool. And notice in verse 1, we're separated to the gospel of God. Starting in verse 2, running through verse 5, is a summation of the gospel of God. Verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That means all of the Old Testament, Testament messianic prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. That means he came from the line of David, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God. So in verse 3, he's 100% man, verse 4, 100% God. Jesus was the man God. That's why he's in some Gospels, he's the Son of Man, and others, the Son of God. He was 100% man, 100% God, for the purpose of satisfying our sin on the cross in his death. Going on in verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, that's the Greek word dunamos, according to the Spirit of holiness. I believe that that alludes to when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism, when John the bapti baptizer was baptizing him, and the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and rested on him. This is my beloved Son in him. I am well pleased. Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I submit to you and I that we all need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I don't mean just salvation and being sealed with the Holy Spirit. I mean the Holy Spirit coming on us for power. 
Much of Jesus' ministry was done in the power of the Holy Spirit. It isn't that he couldn't with uh, couldn't draw resources from his own divinity, but he trusted in the Holy Spirit to give us an example how we would live our lives. I live my life in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then going on in verse 4, by the resurrection from the dead. That was the proof of who Jesus was. It wasn't enough that he died on the cross. That would be great. But without the resurrection, there was no new life. But because he rose from the dead, we all have new life. Going on in verse 5, through him we have received grace. The book of Romans is often called the gospel of grace. The word grace appears so many times. It's a powerful word. Grace is God's unmerited favor. How many would like God's unmerited favor today? Oh, my word. Grace is not getting what I deserve. God's unmerited favor. It's a wonderful picture of his peace and his truth. Verse 5 again, through him we have received grace. Now who is the we in verse 5? Some say that's only the Apostle Paul. Some see it as a broader context for all of us. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for what? For obedience to the faith among all nations. Look down in your handout on the right hand side to Romans 10, 13. For whoever God calls on the name, excuse me, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? That's the apostleship. As it is written, beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16. And they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So back to verse 5 of Romans 1. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations of the world. This is the outreach to the faith among all the nations for his name, not for my name, not my for my church, but for the body of Christ. And then to finish this, verse Six and seven have to do with our calling. Verse six, among whom you are also the call of Jesus Christ. Look again on your handout to Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I believe that God has a call on all of mankind, womankind, anyone who has ever been born. God's desire is that they would come to him that they would be saved. We are the called of Jesus Christ. The book of Ephesians makes it clear those whom he called, he predestined to be conformed to the image of God. I take that verse to mean that God didn't choose in the past who would go to hell and who would go to heaven. But those who have named the name of Jesus, those are the ones that, he's been, that he has called to be predestined to his image and to his will. Verse 7 says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Do we have any saints in here? Can I see your hands? I got quite a few. Some of you aren't really sure. 
Years ago, Judy and I had a favorite Italian restaurant in Long Beach we loved to go to. And the owners were Catholic, and as you went into the uh, entryway of the restaurant, there were statues of saints, probably 25 to 30 of them, all around the walls on pedestals. One day we got there and it was really busy. We had to wait to get in. So we're in line waiting to get a table. And the person in front of us says, he turns around and says, my, look at all of those saints. I bet there's not, not that many saints in the entire world today. And my wife, if you know anything about her, she has a tendency to speak up. I could give you story after story, but I won't. She speaks up and says, well, you're looking at two of them right now. And the guy looked at her like she was nuts. What does it mean to be a saint? It comes from the word hagios, holy, to be set apart. To be set apart for the purpose of God. I'm looking across the room this morning, I see nothing but holy people. Not, not holes in your sweaters, but <laughs> holy people. Why? Because, look at, again, verse 7. This is so cool. Beloved of God. Paul says to the believers in Rome, and he says it to you and I, you're beloved of God. God loves you so much, he sent his only son. Paul on the road to Damascus on his way to persecute the church and was interrupted. If you know Christ is your savior, you've been interrupted from where you were to where you are now. The challenge is to continue to live in Jesus as saints. The church should never look so much like the world that you can't tell it apart from the world. It's easy to criticize the church, but what about me? When I look more like the world, when I act more like the world, when I have behavior and lifestyles that are more like the world than like the Word of God, not only am I not holy any longer, my witness and my testimony is invalidated. It does not have the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that, it's as if when Paul was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, and, he, and the Lord says, I'm the Lord, why are you persecuting me? And Paul said, well, okay, you're the Lord, now let me tell you what I'd like to do in the church. Let me tell you what I'd like my ministry to look like. Let me tell you what kind of church I'd like to have. That's not the attitude of a servant. That's not the attitude of a heart that has received the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. Make no doubt. The reason you're holy is not because you're so good. Do I get a hearty amen? amen. The reason you are holy because of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers you. The reason Judy can say, I'm a saint, is not because she's saintly. 
Oh, wait a minute. I might get in <laughs> trouble with that. <laughs> oh, I think I should have used a different illustration. But it's because the blood of Jesus Christ covers her. She's as holy as God is. Even when she makes a mistake, she has God's grace and forgiveness to cover her. She's called of God separated and so are you called of God and separated the last line on the handout says we are saints and therefore we should live like saints remember I said there are two ways to remember this passage I'm a servant first in other words what I I ask the Lord, Lord, what shall I do? I am called second. Called to be sent into the world. If you want to be a powerful one who has been sent, you must learn, first of all, to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And so serving him you serve others and you fulfill this wonderful gospel of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you touched Rabbi Shaul and he became the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord, for touching us from where we were to now receiving you as Lord and Savior. And if you have never received Christ as your Savior, if you don't have the assurance that if you were to die tonight, you would not see him face to face, I invite you to open your heart and say, Oh Lord Jesus, come into my life. I confess my sins to you. I repent of my sin. I thank you that you were born, that you lived, you died, you went to the grave, rose a grin, all for me. You shed your blood on the cross. You took my sin and gave me your righteousness. I receive all of that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I receive it. Lord, this year as we enter into a new year, let us live as the saints you have called us to be in Jesus mighty name amen, amen. all right let's stand together Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his